to the one who has been forgiven much, they love much. May the words I speak to you become a word from God, God who is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day to you. Kind of a different Sunday for us today. With, uh, well, a lot of things we could say. There's, uh, there's no bulletins because the computer pooped out. And so uh, we'll use the old-fashioned way today and uh, use the, uh, the prayer book for a while. And uh, if you hear a, a fire alarm go off, the fire alarm was going off all night last night. So not to fear, there's no fire. Just uh, talk amongst yourselves and we'll turn it off. If you, if you uh, uh, see me uh, limping around the altar a little bit, it's because I, I whacked my toe. And so um, that's the story behind the priest who limps to the altar. <laughs> and if you're uh, missing Father Al today, uh, he called me at 5 in the morning said, uh, my sciatic nerve on my hip is killing me and I, I can hardly get up today. So he is not here. So it's a different kind of Sunday, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> This is a really amazing story we read from the scripture today. It's very, very beautiful. Some of the most beautiful and poignant and really great stories in the scriptures uh, are about forgiveness. This is not the first one or not the only one that you might remember because they're, um, they're very strong, the ones that are about uh, forgiveness. Just to give you a little in introduction, you know, in a, in a few moments we're going to say the, the Lord's Prayer together. And there's a famous line in the scripture from uh, the Lord's Prayer. It says, God, um, forgive me as much as I forgive other people. I don't like that one too much, but I pray it every Sunday. Because <laughs> forgiveness is so hard sometimes. But God says, I'll forgive you as long as you forgive everybody else. And then there's a famous, really famous story in the Gospel of John about forgiveness where a particular woman is caught uh, sleeping with somebody who's not her husband and they drag her out to the street because in the Jewish tradition uh, anyone who commits adultery could be stoned. Sounds like the Taliban today, right? In the Afghanistan, but in some parts of Judaism in those days they could still do that. And so Jesus... Um, uh, it gets, gets drawn into the story. And you remember his famous line about, about the stoning of the woman? He says, well, if any of you haven't sinned, then you get through the first one. And everybody leaves. And then there's the, really another famous story from the scriptures about forgiveness where it says... Uh, the two men went up to the temple to pray. One of them was a tax collector, a real bad guy. And the other one was a Pharisee. And the tax collector wouldn't even look up to heaven. Wouldn't, wouldn't even approach God. But beat his chest and said, um, Woe is me, a sinner. Please forgive me. And then the Pharisee looks over at the other guy who is begging forgiveness from God. And he says, Well, I'm glad I'm not like him who is such a bad sinner. And Jesus says, well, you know who went home forgiven that day? Well, it wasn't the Pharisee. <laughs> All these great stories, right? These are, these are so memorable. And then today's story is really strong. I'm going to tell it to you in a certain way because I think it's accurate, of course. I wouldn't say it. But you might not pick it up when you first read the story. When you first read the story, it looks like that uh, the woman enters the house where Jesus is having supper with all the men. The Pharisees, all the men are having supper. And it looks like she begins to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair as if this is the first time they've met. But I think it's the other way around. I, I think they, they had known each other before this. And so this bathing of the feet and the way, when she meets Jesus at the table 
It's because they've met before. And he has forgiven her sins before this. Because it says, hence she has shown great love. She didn't do this to get her sins forgiven. She does this because her sins are forgiven. You know what I mean? So imagine this. It says that she was sort of a woman of the streets. A woman um, who might, have, well it doesn't say this, but it implies this. Kind of a, a person of the streets. It could be a prostitute. Uh, everybody knows who she is. <laughs> And that's why the, the Pharisee says, if this man were really a prophet, gosh, he would certainly know who this woman is, because everybody in town knows who this woman is. So she's had a really hard life. And somewhere along the way, she has met Jesus. And she decides that even though she's not supposed to be at the supper with the men, and certainly no woman who is a... Uh, a known notorious sinner would never have entered the house. But she decides, I don't care. I mean, my reputation is bad anyway. I'm just going to go in and do what I want to do, and I'm going to meet Jesus. So she, her life, somewhere along the way, has become really touched by the Lord. And the Lord has made a tremendous change in her life. Because she says, I just don't care. I don't care what they think of me. I don't care how it looks. I don't care if I'm not supposed to be there. I don't care if they hate me. I just feel like I want to say thank you to Jesus. And so, in those days they ate at low tables on the floor. They would sit on the floor. Maybe with their feet out to the side, right? Not underneath the table. And so she just walks in to this room where everyone's gathered for supper and she starts crying. And she, she gets down on the floor and starts crying on Jesus' feet. And then the hair, with her hair she begins to wipe his feet off. And she's brought this little jar of really expensive kind of ointment kind of it's aromatic. You know, people's feet didn't smell good in those days, so they wash them and they anoint them with perfume to make them smell better. And so she washes his feet with her tears, wipes them dry with her hair, and then begins to rub his feet with the ointment. And everybody in the room is staring at her. And so the, the Pharisee who, got in, who invited Jesus thinks to himself in kind of a smart aleck way, well, if he's supposed to be such a prophet, certainly he wouldn't let this woman touch him. And then he, Jesus, turns to him and says, look buddy, I came to your house and you didn't even give me any water for my feet. Everyone's supposed to wash the guest's feet with some water or have somebody do it. And you didn't put oil in my head which is a very hospitable thing to do. It's very uh, honoring to anoint someone's head and hair with oil. And she's been anointing my feet with this ointment all, all the time. And finally, he says, look, you're supposed to at least greet me with a kiss, like you know me, and be socially appropriate. And you didn't even kiss me, and she's been kissing my feet. So I think you better back up. Because even though her sins have been a lot, well, her sins are forgiven. That's why she loves me a lot. I pronounce that her sins are forgiven, and she really appreciates that in a way that you're never going to understand. There was a, a friend of mine uh, back in uh, Houston when I used to live up there. He's married and uh, he's a little bit older than me. His kids are grown up. And he got uh, caught up in um, a certain kind of addiction. And his addiction made him do some crazy things. He, he was a part of my church, so he, he's just your, uh, you would never know it. He looks like a regular old go to church, middle class kind of guy. But he got caught up in this addiction and 
in order to, um, to, to feed and to sustain his addiction, he began uh, stealing money from the family checking account and hiding his tracks. And then it all came out after a while. The addiction overran him. And, and his wife found out not only did he have an addiction, but he'd been, he'd been lying to her about a lot of things, and especially lying about the bank account that he was kind of sucking dry. And it, and it could have obviously broken their marriage. They could have gotten divorced. But over some period of time and over explaining how things went down and learning about addictions and why he did this, and uh, she forgave him for having hurt her so badly and lying so much. And it turned out that their marriage became stronger. It could have killed it, I understand that. But when she forgave him, and he had felt so bad about hurting her. Now he loves her more. Because of what she gifted him, she, she gave him forgiveness. And he received that gift and turned it back into love. So sometimes when you forgive someone, it can be like a, a catalyst for love or a, a, a way to generate love. There are lots of ways you can love, lots of ways of giving gifts. You can give people your time and they'll love you in return. You can give people your attention and it, the people will love you in return. You can give people presents, real presents, <laughs> and the people will love you back. You can give people you're your intimate with, your physical presence and touch, and that feels like love to them. But one of the greatest things you can do one of the greatest gifts you can give is the gift of forgiveness. If you can give that gift, it can generate great love in return. And that's what happened with this lady. The lady who had a very broken life. Jesus says, you know, her sins, which were a lot, well, they've been forgiven. And that's why she shows such great love and tenderness. So, it's a great story about forgiveness and what it can do in people's lives. It can be a generator, a creator, uh, a catalyst for love. If you can forgive, sometimes it creates great love in the person you have forgiven. <laughs> it's funny, of all the things Jesus talked about in his, that are recorded in his stories, and there are lots of different things, there's very little about um, sex, <laughs> or drinking, or dancing, or what books to read, or a lot of things he didn't talk about. He talked about forgiveness a ton, just over and over. <laughs> the woman in adultery, the publican at the temple with the Pharisee. <laughs> he thought it was so important that he, he said, look you guys, when, when you pray, and he gave him that Lord's Prayer, make sure you remember. God will forgive you just as much as you forgive somebody else. He thought forgiveness was essential to a spiritual life and a good life. And here's the final story today. The woman comes to him in the middle of all these men who are holy men and she wasn't supposed to be there. She wasn't supposed to touch anybody. But she cries on his feet and wipes them up with her hair, anoints them with oil or ointment, and kisses them. And she shows such great love and tenderness with no regard for what it looks like. Because when her sins were forgiven, now her heart is full of love. So, there's a possibility here that as you leave church today, that you could be a generator of love for somebody else if you forgive them. You could be the catalyst for love if you let them off the hook. 
You could be the creator of love in the world if the person you need or who wants forgiveness from you, if you give them that gift, it might create more love in the world. Forgiveness is such a complicated topic, I know that. It's hard to forgive. It's more complicated than just saying forgive sometimes. There are, there are huge things that have been broken in the world and things broken in your life by other people. It's not that easy. It's not that simple. But look at what grows out of it. What comes out of forgiveness can be love. Be a generator, a catalyst, a creator of love today. And forgive people. I offer this to you in God's name. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's time for us to say together the Nicene Creed. It's found in the prayer book on page 326. Page 326. We stand together.